Hi, everyone. I think we can get started. Um, good morning and a good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Beijing Center, I would like to extend our great appreciation to everyone for your participation today. This webinar was co-initiated by the Columbia Global the Columbia Global Centers Beijing and the three amazingly creative CU undergraduates, Ji Yu Moon, Yan Hua Chen, and Jesslyn Chagger. And greatly supportive by the Center for uh, Undergraduate Global Engagement. Shout out to you guys. So um, actually, I want to tell you guys that uh, Ji Yu, Yan Hua, and Jesslyn, they're all co-founders of student podcast um, called Silver, The Silver Lining through which they hope to help the public to forge a broader and deeper understanding of East Asian societies. And also what is also worth mentioning here is that this podcast is inspired by the Columbia Global Collaboratory, a program of um, a program initiated and led by the Columbia Global Centers, as well as the Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement, UGE. So um, speaking of that, I want to like thank UGE for promoting, help us promote this event this, at this time. So now please join me to welcome Joe Barea, the Associate Director at the UGE at Columbia University to give us opening remarks. Thanks, Joe. Hi, and thanks so much, Xiaomao. Uh, I appreciate all of the time and, and energy spent in putting together this session. Again, my name is Jill Barea and I'm part of the Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement. Um, obviously, this is in close partnership with the uh, Columbia Global Centers, and so we're delighted to be here today um, and have our students representing because they've actually done so much of the, the hard work behind the scenes. Um, just to give you a bit more of an overview about the Global Columbia Collaboratory, so it was born out of the summer of 2020 in really um, inviting under undergraduates to engage with the broader Columbia Global Network um, and to really start to think about and address some of today's uh, global challenges. Um, it's in partnership with the Columbia Global Centers and the Columbia World Projects as stated earlier. Um, and so they work um, as, as a cohort and then in team-based experiences to really think about uh, some of the, the larger global challenges of today. The collaboratory consists of global uh, seminars that are theme-based, reflection sessions, and then team-based experiences. So today's session is in part due to the wonderful work of Jesslyn, Yanhua, and uh, Ji Moon, um, and their effort as, as part of the cohort last summer um, in, in spinning off the podcast and then obviously this webinar. So kudos to all of you for making this happen. We know what it takes to put on uh, an event and, and have people attend, especially in this virtual space. So delighted to have um, all of you join us today and looking forward to learning with all of you. Thanks. And I'll turn it over to Xiao Mao uh, for the additional updates. Thanks to you all for making the time to join us tonight and also for giving us such um, great opening remarks, also informative um, information about the center and also the project. Um, so today we're deeply honored to have three distinguished panelists. Please join me to welcome Professor Ji-Fen Li, the assistant professor at Chinese philosophy at Renmin University of China, with research interests include comparative studies between Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy, Chinese classical philosophy, and Neo-Confucianism. Thanks, Professor Ji-Fen Li. And Professor Eng Kyung-Shin, the assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Korea University, specializing in sociological investigations with unconventional data resources and a social network analysis. And she was also a Columbia alumni back in 2015, right? <laughs> if I didn't get it wrong. And also uh, Yan Jie Huang, a doctor candidate in modern Chinese history at Columbia University. His research interests center on state society relations from late imperial to contemporary China. And before joining Columbia, he worked as a researcher in a Singapore-based think tank focused on contemporary China studies. As always, your continued support and presence today are highly appreciated by everyone. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our moderators. So let's get started. Thanks everyone. Great, thanks so much, Xiaomo. We can get started with the first third of this panel discussion, which will be a general presentation by our three presenters covering the topic of the history and development of the notion of sacrifice in East Asia. So in this section, we've asked the presenters to address two topics, the first one being 
different interpretations and applications of this notion of sacrifice in East Asia versus the West, as well as different perceptions of the relationship between individuals and society in East Asia versus the West once again. So I just wanna say before we get started that all participants, please feel free to write down any questions that you have in the Q&A section, in the chat section, so that in the very end, we can get to those as well. So I'll now pass it over to Professor Shin to give her presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me this uh, fantastic opportunity. It would be an understatement to say these are very challenging times, but certainly this challenge brought us together in the vulture space, and I was really happy to reconnect with the Columbia community. So thank you again very much for having me here today. So briefly, uh, I will talk about the COVID-19, especially from the perspective of South Korea and how the experience of the infectious orchestrated in the society. Uh, so my name is In Young Shin. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the Korean uh, at the Korean University. But let me briefly introduce who I am, because like I bet a lot of you never heard of me before. Uh, so I graduate. I'm an alumni of this Columbia uh, Korean University, and I got my PhD at Korean Columbia University. Now it's really confused. Columbia University. It's been a while. I got my PhD from the sociology department. It's, 2015, and I also worked as a research faculty at the Columbia Law School. And after that, I went to University of Tennessee Medical School, and I did my fellowship there for three years. Now I'm back as assistant professor at the Korean University. So today, uh, the research you are going to hear a little bit about is that based on my sociological uh, insight, but using a lot of medical research, medical data. So it's a little bit of French uh, medical sociology in a sense. So if you're not familiar with the fields, but uh, I'm sorry about that, but I will make it as plain as possible, okay? So as we all know, pandemic is never new, right? If you look at this photo, it happened, it's Spanish flu that influenced over 50 million people like 100 years ago. But even today, we're struggling with this epidemic. Right. An epidemic, when you're thinking about it, the fundamental of epidemic is an interplay with the virus and the links that virus can travel through. But over the over the years, like we encounter more and more unknown viruses. And we do not know how to deal with this new uh, virus, new entity. So when we do not know how to control the virus, we fight back with the freezing the path of the virus. When you're thinking about this process, freezing up the social relations that already exist in a society, it actually requires a lot of civic participation. You know, you need to give up uh, your social activities out there and you need to wear a mask. You know, have need to voluntarily keep distance from the strangers in the society that you were once mingled together without doubt. So, Let's think about this perspective just a little bit. How much of it is actually rely on the civic voluntarily participation in the process, right? So when I was in New York back in the days and I saw this photograph, what do you think? You may thought this was 2020, like maybe some Seoul or Asia. This is 2015, this is not 2020. I was in New York back then, I was finishing up my dissertation, and I saw this photograph from the uh, news media, and I was like, what's going on? Like, how come they're wearing masks? Like, everyone, really, you cannot find any exception there. And it was 2015, and it was really remarkable because back in the days, the South Korea had experienced the MERS epidemic, the Middle East Refractory Syndrome in 15, 2015, and it only had, I cannot really say it's a small number, but still it had 186 infectious cases and 38 deaths out of them. So, okay, it's highly literal, but still 186 citizens in whole population in South Korea lead to this civic participation in a remarkable scale. How can we make sense of this sort of like, I don't know, if you want to say it's a sacrifice, or maybe it's a sacrifice, but voluntary participation, like how can people do this? 
especially back in the days I was living in New York for 10 years, probably I was more westernized than uh, before. So it seems very foreign to me back in the days. So when I came back uh, 2019, I started writing this paper, looking at epidemic network, how the epidemic actually spread it in 2015 in South Korea. And this is the virus network. And of course, back in the days, I had no idea that 2020 COVID-19 was coming, right? So I was just writing about in your perspective what happened in 2015 because that was so strange to me, right? So this was the epidemic network that happened in South Korea, but people were wearing masks all over and they're really well behaving. Of course, you can see it's a little bit denser than 2020, right? If you take photos of 2020 in these days, people are a little further distanced out. But back in the days, people were not really thinking about the distancing that much, but still wearing masks, everyone does. So I was like, there must be something else. So I looked at the Twitter data that mentioning Maris back in the days, 2015, exactly same time frame from May 20th to December 23rd, what's going on there. And we realized there's almost 102 million tweets mentioning the Maris. A lot of tweets. It's really um, exponential explosion happened in the Twitter world. So this is what there were. And what you see in here, it's only 1% of all tweets. So when you compare what's really happening in real life, uh, offline, this 186 travel loops, that was it. But online, people were exposed to continuous discussion of the MERS virus. So in this paper, I argue it's the function of epidemic. It was function of, it's not the function of epidemic itself, but it's a function of how people talk about this virus. It really matters, you know? If they didn't really talk this much, it didn't spread out that much fear in the society and that we're not gonna lead to the people wearing masks voluntarily, right? So that was the function. And then boom, when I was presenting this paper in New York last year in February, artificial intelligence conference there. And then it was just burgeoning of COVID-19. A lot of Chinese uh, scholars couldn't come to the conference because of the COVID-19 uh, uh, outbreak. And I was like making jokes. Oh my God, when I was writing this paper, I had no idea. And when I was talking that joke, I didn't know it's gonna last for a year, right? And who knows how long we're gonna survive in this way. But so that's what it is. So let's think about COVID-19 just for a while. So when I look at, looking back the MERS epidemic, the changes in 21st century pandemic is not about the virus itself. It's certainly a problem of epidemiology, but it actually connected with epidemiology. When you're thinking about the Spanish flu in the 20th, early 20th century, like 100 years ago, the social network we are living in is completely different. Right, And today we are living in a hyper-connected society with high mobility. The virus had the opportunity to glide over wide range of human network that is incompatible to what it was in 100 years ago, right? And also the information network, it wasn't there back in the days. So in the Spanish flu, people really suffer from lack of information. They didn't know what's going on. On the opposite, we are actually struggling with abundance of the information, what to trust, what is correct, what is accurate, and so on and so forth. And it's also too much noise going on about it, right? So it's not about the epidemiology. We need to fight with epidemiology. So when it comes to COVID-19, I continued another research. I just saw my student's name who are writing this paper with me, the Korea University student just joined us in, this, uh, in the audience, I think. So what about COVID-19? Recently, I submitted a paper uh, with my students uh, that, or, or, and also colleagues, the integrated uh, infodemic surveillance system in the case of COVID-19 in Korea. So we only, we only looking at the first phase of the COVID-19 and probably you heard about this. There is a great shout out from the media. You know, when, if you see this like, gray bar, one of our students, Jin Tebe is in this audience. He made this chart and this bar chart, if you look at this bar chart, you see after first peak, Korean government was really doing good at the taking back, right? So it's 
declined really quickly after. Singing that and the global audience was praising about the house K COVID-19 quarantine is working and so on and so forth, what lesson we can learn from it and so on and so forth. So we're looking at the what, what kind of media exposure is going on with this. And also we look at the Twitter data again. So we compare in this case, looking at the media data, what they're talking about in the news media and also what people, the citizens talking about in the Twitter world. So when we look at the newspaper article, also one of my students, Pyongyun Yoon made this graph and he's also in the audience. Uh, so, uh, so when we're looking at the networks of the people who mentioned in the newspaper articles, they're all focused on the politi politicians. So news media data, they're only talking about political issue and it's early stage and later stage. The politicians getting more central central figures in the news media discourse. And even though it's really a medical issue, you see very small number of individual uh, medical experts were mentioned in the news media. So that was really funny that how the government or the news media talking or politicalized this, politicized this event, medical epidemic event, right? So we look at the Twitter data and this is what we found. So when news media data, very little talking about medical topic, but when it was not the Korea case, because we had the first confirmed case in the January 20th last year. And since then, uh, the most of the topic actually shifted toward the political topics and the news media data. But when you're looking at the social media data, the social encouragement there, people were uh, condolence for those who got infected, uh, let's get it over, like let's have a little more, I don't know, faith in a whatever situation. And they were like really nice to each other in a Twitter word. I thought it was really funny because we rarely do that. You know, online we were cruel and brutal, but in the States, we downloaded all the tweet data and they're really encouraging other citizens in this case. So what, given the short time I left, I would just wrap it up. So the COVID-19 in South Korea cannot understood outside of the context of the MERS experience. As Korean citizens had a relatively recent experience of MERS, maybe that explained a lot of how much the Korean citizens voluntarily participate and collaborate and cooperate with the policy at the moment. Uh, and also the online discourse, the social encouragement discourse is also huge presence in a society that helps people to participate or to sacrifice a little bit of their freedom and liberty. Right, so that's all about what I was going to talk today. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask me questions later on when you open up for questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Professor Shin. That was really fascinating. Your research is not only interesting in and of itself, but also highly relevant. So I'm sure the audience will have something to say. I'll now pass it off to Yanji to give his presentation. Okay, so the vis visible to everyone. Um, thank you, Xiaomo, and uh, also the collaboratory for um, inviting me. Um, it's really a very challenging time, and I was so happy that I can participate in, um, in the effort of um, the Columbia Global Collaboratory to shed some light on recent events that has huge implications, not just for the region, but also for, for the world. And uh, um, I think my presentation will be more of a uh, intellectual historic style. That is, I will focus on the intellectual origins of some of the concepts and the practices uh, that are perhaps useful for us to appreciate the tremendous effort that the Chinese uh, family, civil society, and China state has made to control this um, virus and in a very surprising way uh, within a few months so I was actually quite surprised, in fact, by uh, the tremendous sacrifice that Chinese families and, um, and the state can impose, in fact, on society um, in controlling the virus. Um, so the first question, uh, um, when we want to understand approach the situation from a intellectual historical perspective is the idea of sacrifice. Why should we talk about sacrifice? So, um, um, as an intellectual historian, I think sacrifice 
as a part of a greater uh, package of ideologies really matters in times of crisis. And why it matters is really because sacrifice is truly the political, the ultimate political act, because it concerns the question of what to give up, for what purpose, and how was this giving up to be carried out, especially on a bigger scale for a bigger course that beyond, uh, that goes beyond the individual and families. So as we can understand, sacrifice was a important determinant uh, of state mobilization capacities, because without the ideological foundations that mobilized, that uh, facilitated sacrifice, we cannot imagine that a huge um, uh, state uh, mobilization to be carried out in a time of crisis. And what is particularly relevant in this case, I think, is the modern Chinese idea of sacrifice, uh, which is really uh, very much the currency of uh, the Chinese media uh, nowadays. Uh, but in fact, if we dig it uh, into history, it has a quite torturous uh, historical trajectory that at least went through two major transformations first in the early 20th centuries, uh, and then in the later half of uh, 20th century. And to understand those trajectories, uh, I think would be useful for us to understand how sacrifice was practiced nowadays in China. So the original meaning of sacrifice, xi sheng, right, uh, was in fact quite ritual. So it's really a ritual and material term where it was invented in late Shang and um, possibly uh, in Zhou times. So she was the Chinese character for pure color bu, whereas Sheng was the character for animal victim for ritual sacrifice. So put them together, uh, in most of the Chinese history over the last 3,000 years, it really refers to the, fam uh, the animal victim, right, for ritual sacrifice. And she really, uh, as a modifier, which uh, says a lot about nature victim, that is, it has, to, has a lot of intrinsic value in order to be sacrificed. And then only in the early 19th century, uh, 20th century, the term end, underwent a tremendous transformation from a noun that refers to ritual, uh, ritual victim to a verb that refers to an act. From a ritual context to a figurative uh, context that refers most specifically to a political act or socially motivated moral act. So basically means giving up the smaller self for the larger good. So it was expanded to uh, many, many different kinds of use. First, it can refer to complete sacrifice in terms of martyrdom, a tremendous act of heroism, like in the case of right, Li, Hong, uh, Li Wenliang and other doctors that were celebrated nowadays in Chinese media, uh, and also commemorated by um, the, the Chinese society. Partial sacrifice, giving up property, time, use, personal valuables, uh, and money. So that was uh, you know, uh, applied in a very wide range of practices uh, in the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Passive sense, sacrifice victim as someone who was actually imposed to sacrifice. And that also was the experience that shared by many uh, Chinese, uh, especially in uh, Hubei Wuhan. Right? That's the initial feeling that uh, they expressed in Twitters, uh, sorry, in the Chinese Twitter and other social media accounts that they are being victimized by the state. So, um, so my approach to you, to the notion of sacrifice was to understand how the context of the transformation actually uh, or shaped the kind of transformation that we see in the meaning of the term. Uh, so, to put it very simply. We can uh, understand four kinds of contexts. So in terms of political context, uh, the modern concept of sacrifice really happened in the new context of modern state, right? the modern national state. Uh, whereas the, this ritual uh, idea of sacrifice of the animal victim was appropriate to a universal empire. Uh, and that was an empire that was um, undergirded by a certain kind of universalistic ideology like Confucianism. And second, in terms of cosmology, in terms of conception of time, um, it started with this cyclical time of eternal return uh, with heaven and nature in, 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 um, as, uh, as, a, as the ultimate uh, truth to the linear time of sacrifice, right? Linear time of state building, linear time of um, family making, linear time of personal development. 
And then from a spiritual perspective, um, in late in pure time, sacrifice happened in a universe that was defined by qi, right? The imminent and sort of uh, this <clears throat> uh, cosmological uh, spirit that was intermingled as material. And then today, what was the talking of today, um, uh, 20th century China, was the term jingshen, which originally was actually part of the qi, but was extracted and transformed to refer to a new transcendent and non-material kind of spirit. So today, when we talk about sacrifice in China, we always associate it with the term jingshen. And ultimately, it also has to do with this ethical transformation that happened in 20th century China, when the first sacrifice was very closely related with moral cultivation, right? Moral self-cultivation in Confucian term, I think Dr. Uh, Professor Lee will have much more to say on that. Uh, but just to summarize, it really means self-cultivation from this self uh, um, to the family and then ascending to the community and then to um, the world, right? That's the Confucian concept of the heaven uh, ha uh, or and the heaven. Whereas in modern times, of course, it was transformed into a certain kind of linearized ideological course, the isms, whether it's nationalism, communism, or whatever isms, that refers to you kind of Christianized uh, modern worldview. And this is the kind of sacrifice that we are talking about when China was combating the uh, COVID-19 crisis. So um, the contemporary China sacrificed again and went a major transformation. And that has to do uh, with the traumatic experience that Chinese society uh, has undergone in the Cultural Revolution. And um, to put it in a larger historical context, the Communist Revolution. So in a sense, today when the Chinese people talk about sacrifice, it was not like in those revolutionary days when it was purely associated with national, uh, with this um, socialist course or with nationalist course. Today, there's a return of self-cultivation. So people are actually uh, talking more and more uh, about self-cultivation as this ultimate good that has more to do with bodily health and the wealth accumulation, uh, especially when it refers to family. And even if we reserve the state uh, ideology of post-cultural revolution China, uh, this whole idea of communism was actually replaced by a more and more depoliticized idea of family welfare, Xiao Kang, uh, which serves as the ultimate goal, right, that China state will strive to achieve, not just for China's economic development, but moreover for the common good that was defined by each and every family's material uh, and social well being. So, under this new concept of sacrifice, there are three um, very important uh, social trend. First is uh, the withdrawal from the public course. So after 1970s, sacrifice was no longer associated with like giving up your life for um, the revolution, right? For a larger course. It's more and more associated with, uh, in the private sphere within the family. So the most prevalent form of sacrifice in nowadays China was actually sacrifice that the parents did for their children. So the parents in China, just like in any Asian uh, East Asian society was spent very much on the children's education and whatever, that will serve the children's good as kind of new transcendent, new transcendent, uh, transcendent goal of, of, of their life. Uh, but in fact, if we you know, look into history, it was a um, relatively late development. Uh, this kind of practice only uh, took off sort of in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so um, when we talk about Maoist families, um, it was really not like that. Um, and then it's very much focused on the family, family state synergy. So state objective are only was the objective sacrifice when it coheres with family objective like economic growth, which in China translated very um, easily in urban uh, uh, middle class context into family well-being and housing price. And of course, that applies to uh, the COVID-19 crisis when the emergence, emergence situation of controlling virus was immediately translated into the family's survival. Um, and also the focus on children, right? Uh, that is very unique again, uh, um, in fact, historically uh, to the uh, Chinese middle-class families. So why did this new mode of sacrifice work very well for a pandemic uh, in, uh, 2020 China. 
So as we have um, right, came across um, in our understanding of transformational sacrifice, that nowadays after 1970s, natural response for the Chinese family to an external crisis was in fact very much shaped by the experience in uh, the Mao days. So when there is a crisis happening outside family, the family will get, get getting very uh, united in fighting the crisis. And the basic act is to, is to withdraw inside the family network uh, and friend network, friendship network. And in, in the Chinese case, of course, it's um, very figuratively portrayed by this uh, uh, right? the family holding hands together within the home. So when there is a crisis, these boundaries of the family become extremely important. And that's why actually Chinese, uh, it's very easy for contemporary Chinese to understand the importance and also make sacrifice for quarantine. And then there's a sense of the blaming and self-blaming for the sick. So because of body cultivation becomes so important in the post-cultural revolution days, self-care of the body, especially for the elderly, becomes a pervasive concept uh, among urban uh, middle-class Chinese. So, the, so basically the elderly who are the most vulnerable population, they are extremely self-conscious of practicing Pre, uh, protecting their own health, but also, pre, but also they know the importance um, of practicing, practicing their own health for the family and for the nation. So it's very easy to actually mobilize the elderly for the effort of, uh, um, for those internal crisis efforts uh, in this virus context. And then there's uh, this internal cohesion within the family, which is kind of depoliticized family pr first principle so the family, when it becomes united, it doesn't really care about much of the politics, right? Uh, and that coheres, of course, with the post-cultural revolution kind of mentalities when the family were totally fearful of any form of politics. So that actually gave a lot of free room to state action. So unless the state action immediately uh, uh, actually impeded or uh, harmed the families, the family will give up everything uh, very, uh, and make huge sacrifice for every sort of state actions uh, and give up uh, the freedom of gathering, of course, which appears to be very costly in certain countries. It uh, doesn't really apply to, um, to China. Um, so, um, and a strong anti-crisis state, right? So, so because the, the withdrawal, the re, 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 uh, redrawing of boundaries between society and state after the 1970s, there is maximum development of state capacity since 1990s. So there's a lot of room for state to mobilize resources when its objective coheres uh, with the objective of each urban families. So that happens uh, again in the crisis last year. So what we see is a huge coordinating effort uh, with both organized top-down sacrifice imposed on certain people and also voluntary bottom-up sacrifice, which I, I will argue actually is much more consequential and much more characteristic of China for a certain kind of purpose. And the crisis of COVID-19 certainly give up, give shape to this kind of coordinated effort of sacrifice. So in conclusion, I, I argue that sacrifice matters a lot for to understand the COVID-19 crisis in China. Um, and to understand that we need to understand it both in historical and also contemporary notions, just to explore a bit into depths of time, to understand the motive and also the actions of contemporary Chinese. And then we also need to understand that um, this has helped China to succeed so far, but it doesn't mean that it will actually uh, help China to succeed eventually. So you eventually succeed, uh, Chinese society and the state will need to more, mobilize more resources and, uh, uh, and, and perhaps rely less on the, um, on the contemporary concept of sacrifice uh, and to coordinate the effort in like vaccine development and also social, um, and economic reconstruction after the crisis. And of course, I don't have time. And also I, I don't really have the experts uh, to talk about how the Chinese model of sacrifice compare to the West and even to other East Asian uh, models. So I'm here, I'm really looking forward to exchanges with you guys uh, and all the, and the experts. So we can understand China in you know, a more comparative uh, perspective. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Yanzi. Um, your research obviously inspired this panel discussion to exist in the first place. So it's great to hear more from you. I'll now turn it over to Professor Lee to give her presentation. Actually, thanks, thanks very much. And um, Professor Xin and Professor Huan, I'm very happy to join this talk today, especially in this special challenging time. Um, again, hi everyone, my name is Li Jifen. And today I don't have any PowerPoint or slides. I have thought it's a, a very informal dialogue, so I don't prepare this kind of things. Um, I think Professor Huang already have show or uh, presented a very good gu guideline understanding sacrifice this but this very special concept, especially the transformation history in China. I, I don't have this cap this background, so actually when I heard about it, I also have this kind of question. So what is sacrifice in our understanding now? So next I will also talk about the definition of sacrifice, but I don't have this kind of uh, uh, historical understanding. I just uh, understand it from my experience or from my um, feelings, this kind of things. Um, okay, honestly speaking, when I heard the word of a sacrifice, I felt a little bit weird for me. Why? I mean, as a member of the community here in my city, Beijing, uh, I don't have, I do have followed the, the government or the city rule, both in my working time and in my home time. Of course, mostly of the time I stay at home, especially in the past one or two years in confronting the, situa the situation of COVID-19. COVID I will never think that the spirit of sacrifice have any connection with me. I will never think that it is connected with me. Do I have this kind of spirit of a sacrifice? There's a mark for me. Why? Why I have this kind of feelings? Because it seems like that this spirit of a sacrifice is kind of like, a, for me, it's kind of like a big hat that is not everybody in the street can wear. <laughs> So in other life, normally we do not use this word to describe an action such like that you just stay at home to avoid a danger, right? This is what we ordinary people do in front of COVID-19, right? I've never think it is connected with me. So it seems like that the spirit of uh, sacrifice in our culture always goes to an extraordinary action like that you sacrifice your personal interest, your personal desire, your personal comfort, all the interest of your family in order to make the community, the nation or the whole nation to have a better future or to have a better progress, something like this. So like the doctors or like the nurse who have voluntarily applied to go to the city of Wuhan, or we, we all know this, right? They apply to go to the city to give a help, to take care of the patients. So in doing this, they give up their time to stay at home with their parents, with their children, or their husband or wife. They have risked their lives, something like their lives, to help others who were suffering because of the COVID-19. For those people, they do have, for me, I think the actions have perfect show or present the spirit of sacrifice. So I think this spirit of sacrifice goes to them, not to me, because I don't do this kind of things. I just stay at home and take care of my babies. So how about me, right? Because lots of people, there are many people like me, just to stay at home this kind of ordinary people. So how to describe or talk about their actions? Maybe I think I would like to choose another word, maybe dedication. I don't know whether this is a better or an appropriate word. So in Chinese, we call it as feng xian. Actually in Chinese, we always put xi sheng and feng xian together to say that somebody have the spirit of sacrifice and dedication. Actually, Professor Huang has talked about this kind of jingsheng, right? Xi sheng feng xian jingsheng. 
So you dedicate yourself to something. So in doing this, what I want to emphasize or what I try to, what I try, uh, what I want to express is that you want to help others in suffering is primarily because, because you have seen somebody suffering there. And this situation makes or stirs you or moves you to do something, to take an action. For example, we know the situation in Wuhan was very bad. And we can know it from the report, from the pictures, from the videos, the words on the line. All of these make us feel the suffering there. And this kind of feeling motivates us to take a further step. But this feeling is not about yourself, it's your feelings about others. So we can find this is very similar to the argument of Munchers, uh, who is uh, one of the Asian Confucians. He proposed that if you see a child, we all know this, right? It's very famous. So if you see a child about fell into a wheel, you naturally have a feeling of empathy, which for Munchers is the sprout of benevolence, or in Chinese word, we call it as zhen. And then you will think, how can I do something? How can I take an action appropriately to help the child or the people in suffering? So it is in this way, another important concept in Confucianism that is appropriateness or e comes in. So it is in this second step, you would take an action to sacrifice something like your time, your energy, your property, and something like this. So why I want to choose another word. So the difference for the sequence between dedication and sacrifice, we can talk about whether dedication is a appropriate word or not. But the, the point I want to emphasize is that the sequence is very important. If I understand sacrifice appropriately, it means you have to think about the issues about yourself, the self issues first, and then decide to take a further step, like you give up something you have. But for dedication or for the feng xian, the picture is different. You see something there outside of you and you want to do something for that. And then the sacrifice issues comes in. For example, you would take an action, you would take this kind of action to help others. Like that if you are a nurse, right? You want to help others with your professional nursing skills. If you are a driver, you would like to drive your car to help the people you need, like the nurse, they want to go home to have rest and then come back to the hospital. We all know this from the media. So you would consider about what you have, your time, your energy, your property, and so on to have others. So others always come in first. But in the meantime, I have to agree that sacrifice and education, these two words do have something that is very similar. For example, no matter what happens in you or no matter what happens to you, Finally, you have to give up something. In this point, the two come to each other very closely. And I think maybe this is why in our culture in China, we always put them together to say, oh, you have this kind of spirit of uh, sacrifice and dedication. And both of them have been highly regarded in the Asian culture. But what I want to highlight is that they are highly regarded, not because you have given up something, but because you carry others, but because your love to others. So the first point I have presented is that others outside of you always come in first, rather than the considerations of yourself. 
So next, the second point I want to emphasize is that the communicate culture. Actually, I think this is a, a very complicated issue. Actually, in talking about the understanding of sacrifice and dedication and the confusion concept of benevolence and appropriateness, I already have mentioned it a little bit. That is, we always or naturally have the sensitivity of others. So the people around you are very important to you. You have a natural feelings toward them, like your love, your children, your, your care for your children, your parents and your friends. You do love them, right? These feelings are very important part of you. And you do care about them. You do love them. And these natural feelings of others always make you primarily, firstly, to care about them. So in caring, caring others, in loving others, you would like to do more to preserve this kind of feelings. Thus, in this sense, the private family issues are closely connected with the public affairs, like the public policy. So, in the ordinary life, why do we agree to obey the government policy of wearing masks outside of your home? Why do we agree to stay at home as possible as we can? Why do we agree to let others know the record of your movements? So much this kind of sense, why? I think, one important reason is that this is a way, whether it is direct or indirect, to love others, to care about others around you, a way to guarantee the safety of your child, of your parents, of the people closely connected with you. So in this sense, the private family issues and the public affairs are not to totally different areas. I think this is a very special char characteristic of uh, Chinese culture, and we can find a very similar expressions in the ancient Confucian classics, like one chapter of the records of uh, rice, Li Ji, that is great learning, Da Xue. So it says that we have the requirement of self-cultivation. Professor Huang also mentions about this, right? We have the requirement of self-cultivation. And also, we also have the requirement of regulating your families and governing the nations and even the whole universe. The latter of which can be extended from the former one and also can guarantee the success of the former one. So in this sense, I think the concept of words like the community, the nation, all of these kind of words are not just abstract words. So this close relationship between the private family issues and self-cultivation sense and public political affairs is the second point I want to emphasize in this talk. And finally, I think the spirit of community maybe is more applicable than the spirit of sacrifice to describe the actions of every citizen, the ordinary people like me in front of the COVID-19 in China. Okay, I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Li, for this very insightful sharing, and it provides a very good segue to um, our next section of this panel discussion. Um, we want to, um, since we have already talked a little bit about um, sacrifice in China, we want to direct our next question to um, Professor Sheng. Um, is there any equivalent of sacrifice in South Korea or um, more generally, how has the South Korean government um, shaped the cultural narrative uh, to urge people um, to cooperate or to abide to the rules during this pandemic? Uh, 
Thank you for the question. It's a really good question. And I really enjoyed the talk at the, about the Chinese situation. And I realized um, the Korean situation is a little different from the China, as I think if someone asked the question in the first place, because we are like Korean citizens are a lot more opinionated. You know, we are more, I don't know, it's hard to enforce according to uh, uh, Huang's presentation. He mentioned about the organized sacrifice that is actually enforced by the government, right? But it it happens all the time, right? South Korean government had its own rule that you are not allowed at the very moment, you're not allowed to have a gathering, private gathering of number of more than five people, like you're not really allowed. So there are a lot of enforcement from the government. But the sacrifice, I think I echo the Professor Lee's, uh, the first question, am I sacrificing? Like, is it really the right feeling in the South Korean society at the very moment? It's a questionable somewhat because when you sacrifice something, it is something that you give up your own self-interest for someone else, right? But in this case, the boundary between your interest and my interest is extremely blurred. For example, my infection is contingent on your infection, right? I'm not only uh, behaving for your own safety, but I'm also behaving an accomplice because it's also related directly related to my own infection too. So that's the nature of the epidemic. So in this case, it's really hard to draw a boundary between is it a sacrifice for someone else or is it an act based on my self-interest because I don't want to get infected, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think, I'm not sure if I'm answering it the right way, but that's my feelings about if I really think about this as a sacrifice. Uh, I'm not a, a representative of a South Korean citizen, so don't quote me on that, but my glimpse idea, uh, because we are more like culturally westernized and somewhat in between. We do not, we have moved beyond those kind of traditional collectivism uh, that were emerging here. A Confucianism, yes, we do still have a strong bonding of the family and the community and so on and so forth. And we care about their well being very much. Uh, but I think there was more of eager perspective in this uh, compliance. I'm doing this uh, because it's also on my safety. It's also on my well-being. So I don't really consider it as a sacrifice, but I think it is more of civic responsibility, right? So I think that's my answer. Yeah, thank you, Professor Shin. Um, that's a very interesting philosophical um, thinking of um, sacrifice and um, how it's, it has played a role in the pandemic and how the Western and the Eastern um, ideas differ. Uh, we have just one more question before we move on to the Q&A session. Um, because in China or maybe more generally in East Asia, when we talk about sacrifice or equivalent notions, we talk a lot, um, we very much talk about sacrifice and women and like the traditional role of mother. Um, and we were just wondering um, what are the gender roles um, in this pandemic? Um, how have women played a role? And um, sacrifice or not, um, is there any cultural narrative that is pushing women to do more or is um, there deferred responsibilities um, for women? Um, maybe all three of our panelists can speak more about that. I do see uh, the burden of this uh, social distancing it actually affects people in a different ways, certainly. And especially, and I, 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 originally I had the slides, do I have it? Okay, let me quickly share this. This is not my slide, I mean, not my theory. So uh, if you know the Robert Fly, he's from the public policy in the UC Berkeley, and he actually published it in the UC Berkeley blog that unequal consequences of social distancing. So if you look at the slides, the remotes, the professionals, you know, they have very minimal influence. I can work from home uh, or those professionals and attack years, Google, Facebook, they can work from home, right? Mm -hmm. they, they can actually work and continue their life as remote and the essentials like doctors, 
soldiers, police, no matter what, they got to do their job. So they continue with their life. But the unpaid, and remarkably, they have a lot of people belongs to this category, actually, they suffer more. And even worse is the forgotten, the homeless people, the people in the jail, and those people living in the gray areas in a society. We all exposed to many different weights of social distancing. And in, the, in that context, yes, as a minority in the labor force, or in a traditionally women suffered uh, or have more t responsibility in house care, in a, uh, domestic labor, which is undervalued, obviously. And I do remember the UN declared this COVID-19 unjustly uh, put more weights on the female uh, worker, especially they project, the companies project as if the childcare as a solely like female responsibility, oh, you gotta stay at home as opposed to male worker and so on and so forth. So certainly, um, I think when it comes to the domestic labor, especially the child related to the child, certainly I think female uh, does have a harsher blush with this uh, COVID-19, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I want to follow your line because I don't have to uh, do lots of research about this, but I have a very, personal experience because now I have a baby just one year old. You know what I can, what's going on here. Because for the past one year, I can, especially when the COVID situation here is very bad, every people stay at home. But I know my colleagues, they still have time to publish the papers, to write some comments online. But for me, my situation is that I even don't have time to open my laptop. I even don't have time to pick up my phones because even eating a super, eating a lunch is a problem for me. I need to take care of the children. I don't have any people to help me about that. So this is very hard. I don't have time to do anything else. So I have this kind of experience. I can see the hardship, hardship, hardship here. So how about, how about Professor Huang? So <laughs> sharing, yeah. My, I think my wife were um, like 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 your situation, except that I, I can sometimes help out because I'm I, I don't need to go to New York these days. So I I really very much in, um, agree with yours that. Um, because of shutdown of schools, I think this is very universally true that schools are shut down and uh, a lot of daycares. So we had also two months of baby where at this point of deciding the daycares. And it really had tremendous effect on the productivity of, um, I mean, or the the circle that I'm, the female, the, the, the circle that I'm, I'm not familiar with certain female scholars who, who are actually more adversely impacted than the male colleagues because these, the, the immediate social impact of the pandemic is really taking uh, these um, formally socialized uh, care uh, and then domesticated it, right? So the whole yeah. the family has taken uh, a lot of responsibilities that were actually uh, had to be marketized for decades mm -hmm. In the Chinese or in the American case, so 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 I definitely agree with that. And and I think another issue in the Chinese context is that uh, I don't know whether it's the, uh, this is a product of current uh, official ideology whatsoever that female uh, sacrifice and um, and contributions, right? Especially the nurses who are really in the front line of this fight against the pandemic were not really celebrated uh, proportionally to their uh, sacrifice in the state media, mm -hmm. right? When we watch these uh, various documentaries and uh, I think there's a, there's a, there's a teledrama on the Wuhan uh, situation in March. Ah. Women were totally underrepresented. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure what, what is behind that, but I'm sure that there's a, this almost innate uh, tendency um, uh, in the Chinese elite circles to downplay gender perspective, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not 
I, I, I won't say it's in, 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 in intended, it's an intended act, but it's definitely uh, uh, reflective of certain kind of like tendencies, ideological tendencies, right? Conservative tendencies among the Chinese uh, elites that, um, that they tend to downplay uh, gender uh, and women's roles uh, in this huge um, heroic, in their heroic act to, 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 to take control of the crisis. And, uh, and I do think that's a, that's a very serious problem that we need to tackle with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you all for your thoughts on that. We have a bit of time to move to the Q&A section. We have some great uh, questions from the audience. If they want to keep asking questions in the chat as well, um, we can continue to ask them. Um, but the first question from the audience is, is it acceptable in academia to equate the notion of sacrifice with collectivism? And a related question is, does the transformed definition of sacrifice under the Cultural Revolution in China mean there is more room for individualism now? Maybe we can start with uh, Professor Huang. Well, thank you for um, the very insightful questions. Uh, I think sacrifice nowadays does not really uh, I, I, and, and I have to clarify that I use sacrifice in a very broad way. So dedication uh, in my understanding is also part of sacrifice, though uh, I, I back uh, Professor Lee might disagree, but, uh, but that's my understanding. So, so it's very subjective in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. What is whatever that is valuable is, is you, I mean, we, we learn about this term that is pure colored bull is the first Chinese mm -hmm. category. Character. And then the family, the, the victim. So, so if you something that is not valuable, it does not consider. It's not considered a sacrifice, right? So, um, so, 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 but so basically, everything that was um, valuable that was um, taken out of yourself for something else, so for others, was considered a sacrifice. So even within the family, there are huge sacrifices made every day, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to say that family is collective, is collectivism, I, I don't, I, I would back to differ, but it's, but it's not really right, a collective in the sense of the state, uh, an organized collective. So, so if you want to um, use the collective in a political sense, I would say that sacrifice does not, uh, is not uh, really uh, directly associated with any form of collectivism. And even in a liberal society, there is huge, I mean, I, and, I, and I, I think actually in liberal society, um, sa sacrificing a private sense is much more appreciated and articulated because exactly because of individualism, because people are more uh, aware of values of self, right? Um, they didn't internalize the um, like so-called collective ideologies. Uh, and then in that sense, actually sacrifice was, uh, we see more <laughs> stories of sacrifice in fact. Uh, and more articulation of sacrifice uh, sometimes in the media. So, so that's the first question. And I, I don't think there's intrinsic link between sacrifice and, uh, and collectivism. And for, uh, sorry, the second question is about cultural revolution. Um, the second question is about whether there is a growing room for individualism in China. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so a lot of uh, sociological works have already demonstrated that there's much more rooms of individualism um, after the end of cultural revolution, especially in the, um, in the private sphere, especially in these um, these spheres that uh, that are not directly controlled by the states or where the state uh, withdrew. Um, so we see that there's a vibrant. Um, uh, so um, civil society, uh, at least in certain sectors of Chinese society, right? Even nowadays, uh, like um, um, that has nothing to, that has less to do with politics basically, uh, like sports, uh, entertainment. Uh, you see those like street dances, right? <laughs> Very emblematic of uh, uh, urban Chinese culture. So anything that is not directly like defined by the state, that has been liberated uh, more or less um, 
um, uh, liberalized after the Cultural Revolution. And I think it's still very much um, uh, free space. Although it's definitely uh, we have to uh, agree that the boundary between this uh, politics and non-politics is totally fluid, fluid and it's constantly moving. So we're not sure the degree of this kind of freedom and whether it will, will actually uh, resist like that. That's Thank great. Um, Professor Lee, we had a, a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke about how Confucianism affects um, people's behaviors and attitudes towards sacrifice. And an audience member asks, um, in other Asian countries with no belief of Confucianism, do you think um, it has the same effect? How do people respond to sacrifice in those countries? Yeah, I have um, noticed uh, this kind of uh, questions, but I want to talk first about Professor Huang's discussions. Because yeah, I, in my understanding of uh, sacrifice, I, I have a little bit of worry there because even if we go back to the origin of this concept that is about to the bull, we show it to the god, ancestors, or ghosts there. It seems like you show something that is very valuable to, to you to, and then you show it to others. You give it to others. But in this kind of action, there's a kind of, can we say exchange? Or can we say you have a requirement from you? You want to get something. So in that sense, it is from you to others. And then you want to get something back. I think this is a kind of individual. So it, it is kind of self, interest can i say that so that is why i don't like it i think baby is not very good it's not so appropriate so and this understanding is also connected with this question so if we understand it as oh if people outside of china they don't have this kind of culture they don't they don't have this kind of uh, understanding of confucianism how do they alter your behaviors how could it affect your behaviors. Because for me, yes, we have different cultures. We have a different background. We have different history and this is true. But all of us are human beings, right? We all have a kind of natural feelings to others. I don't know whether, I think a lot of the students don't have the feelings of to become a mother. Whenever you have the natural feeling to care of the children, you never think about yourself. You care your children not because of your self-interest. Do I really need to get something from my children? No. I have this kind of natural feeling to care about him, to take care of him. I will never to think about the things from him. But I do need something. For example, I need to get the response, right? I have to, hey, how are you? And then he smiles. I need this kind of response. Of course, it is true. But the initial response or the, the initial, the, the intention he, there is I want to take care of him. I want to, I want to be sensitive to his desires. And I think among human beings, you also have this kind of similar feelings and your love to your children is just one of them. So we have different cultures, but all of us are human beings. We all have this kind of uh, relations. We have this kind of uh, connections. So this is universal. This is true and some sense of uh, ontological sense, we are connected with each other. So it is not something to, to, to change you, something outside of you. Like, I think lots of people understanding confusion rights, like something regulating yourself, regulating your body, right? To, hey, you need to change your desires, the interest. I don't think so. 
because of the, the rice is a way to express your desires, to express your feelings. So there is something inside of you and inside each of us, even we are in different countries, we are in different backgrounds, but we do have this kind of basic sense of connections. Okay. Professor Shin, I'd love for you to um, add anything uh, on this topic, but also um, we had a question about how we tackle infodemiology and what's the best way to tackle misinformation that you spoke about in your presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, I think echoing to the, the collectivism or the notion of sacrifice of what the Western culture, that's the first question that we were asking. I think I personally, from my experience, it's it. From my understanding, from my perspective, it felt like a royalty, right? And how much you can actually give up or sacrifice is based on your royalty. So in a Western culture, we'd have a certain royalty. I mean, like I just said, we whoa, that was surprising. <laughs> that we have that uh, royalty. I think that um, reflects like some sort of a social solidarity that we talk about. That in a in a sociology, we understand the social solidarity in a mechanic way <clears throat> that could be understood as a collectivism based on the similarity. We share the same belief like Confucianism. So we have this, we manifest this strong solidarity. But in a modern world, in a Western society, they have, or we have um, the organic solidarity based on our diversity, based on our difference, we also uh, manifest some type of solidarity, right? So it does not have to be like clear cut Confucianism or collectivism in a, in a way or mm -hmm. not, because human beings, whether it's old or new, or whether it's in the East and the West, we need other people, we rely on other people, and there's certain emotion flow together. The basis or the source of the emotion could be different from here or there. Uh, but I think uh, the sacrifice we may not call it, or other people may not call it a sacrifice, but I think it's very similar concept of royalty and also civic responsibility. As a citizen, I do my duty. Mm -hmm. It's a royalty for the society, royalty for the country, royalty for my family, and so on and so forth. And for the infodemic uh, question, thank you for the question. It is a huge problem. And also WHO announced that the fight against the infodemic is very early on. You know, in the last February, actually, last year, February, because when it happened, the high level of anxiety produced lots of fake news and a lot of blaming, you know, those who got infected and also the blaming for the China and the, the, all the politics against it. So they were like fighting against it because it's not really helping. I try to like uh, highlight the positive part of it for the short time period in my presentation, but also there's a huge problem. In an infodemic, people only looking at what they want to do, what they want to see. So mm -hmm. on a digital space, you can just narrowly delve into the word that you believe it as that's true. So people do not hear about other things. So if you're caught up in the fake news, if you're caught up in the, this fake drone, then it's really hard for you to see other way around. Yeah. So infodemic, especially in this kind of epidemic and a pandemic that happened in a global stage, it's extremely dangerous. It could be more dangerous than the virus itself. I would say this because you will never see. I mean, like, it's very, um, I don't know, I shouldn't really say this because now it's really, uh, the scale has been really magnified a lot, but it's unlikely for you to meet the person who actually carries the virus in your real life. But you are so not free of all the information about epidemics. The COVID-19 information, probably I exposed how many news articles I've read today about it? How many online tweets and information I just consumed today? Mm -hmm. It's funny that I never met anyone who actually carries the virus, right? So infodemic is a lot closer to our daily yeah. life for most of the citizens. Right. Right. So I think that's really, that really echoes the importance of infodemic. And still, I don't have the solution how to solve this fake news and all the war in an infodemic but a lot of scientists we try to identify what are the fake how to detect 
the fake news compared to the right sources of information and so on and so forth. And also a lot of education is going around like to consume at the reliable information. So yeah, thank you for the question. And sorry that I don't have the really good answer, but we are fighting for it. I hope things are getting better. Yeah. No, definitely. And on a related note, we wanted to ask all our panelists, what is the rhetoric surrounding COVID-19 in the mainstream media? And is the notion of sacrifice invoked? If so, how does it contribute to the government's handling of the pandemic? Maybe I can start because easy, easy question for me because media, um, it's really interesting to, who asked this question? Um, this question itself has an assumption that government is really shaping the discourse on the media, right? Uh, and it's kind of um, hard, unimaginable in the South Korean situation and probably in the United States too. There is a speculation and there's few uh, news outlets that certainly support the government and influenced highly by the government's opinion about the situation, but also there are a lot of independent news outlets, right? So in these days, especially in the digital space, it's really hard for the government to control, especially in censorship in South Korea is extremely, uh, how do I say, it's a really hot issue. People are very against about the censorship. So, government is shaping the news media discourse as doubtable, but they control the information, right? And the how, who, really, who get to release the information about the patients and the current state. So could be they can manipulate and the digital space information display and portray of the situation, but it's hard to say how the, uh, the government's influence we can see, or the, at least the evidence for the top-down uh, enforced sacrifice in it. It's really hard to distinguish from it. And also like, especially because we, uh, I, I mean, my students in the audience can help me because they actually look at the media data. Sacrifice was never, I wouldn't really say, there could be some issues around it because all these people, especially small shop owners, they, they really uh, suffer the most. So you can say that kind of huge diesel discourse on them actually melted into sacrifice from the outsider perspective. They're not allowed to run their business. They're running out of their business. They really cut off the source of the income and they're not allowed to actually run it by the government. So it's a huge sacrifice on them, but actually their whole huge lawsuit is going on. Those people also fighting back, suing to the government to pay back the, their loss of income and so on and so forth. So it's still ongoing, um, uh, but I'm not entirely sure how this like relation between the sacrifice, the media representation and the government in the triangle, how they dance together. It's so much blurred. Yeah, I agree. I, I think I don't have much to say about it in these issues because, yeah, I agree, especially in China, right? We have this kind of uh, manipulating powers. We can feel it very greatly, especially for the medias. But in modern world, we have lots of ways to know something. I mean, not only the TVs, the videos, the WeChat, and also we have this kind of uh, people connections. I mean, you know, we are always connected with each other. So maybe you know something and then everybody around you and then around everybody in different cities will get that. I think, yeah, it is very hard now to totally manipulate something. So maybe I think that is why um, in, in the policy now, they, they, they have I think more free now, can we say that? <laughs> because it's very, in my modern world, now it's very hard to control as what they have done before. Uh, um, it's my turn. Yeah. Okay. I, I think China's government, I mean, that's the, um, um, the, that's the, that's the, because I'm a, China, especially, so I'm, I, I talk more about China's case. I, I think it has went beyond this mere control, right? Using rhetoric of sacrifice to mobilize people. 
uh, that was the case of like um, the revolutionary days, right? And we know that Chinese government also learned to adapt its informatic strategies. So nowadays, I, it's much more complicated. Um, I would say uh, emotional management, right? So it actually attract uh, the emotional, um, so it actually use AI to attract kind of emotional uh, trends on the Chinese social uh, network. And then it will uh, deploy certain kind of um, strategies that were appropriate to the situation, right? When the Liu Wenliang case was surging to the very high, right? And mobilized social opinions against wow. government they actually just joined the trend. They, they actually mobilized their, their net, network workers to, to join the trend. And then because the social opinions are always cyclical, it will eventually add, right, way down. And the government will introduce another set of rhetoric. Uh, and then afterwards, when people become forgetful, right, people forget because we came, came through the crisis, the government will then use another kind of rhetoric. So sacrifice will deploy in very strategically at different and very, uh, in very different forms through very different kinds of uh, situations when the government were constantly checking what people are thinking. So, so, so this is a very, I would say it's very successful man social management. And, uh, and uh, I suppose that it's also quite unique, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you can see that sacrifice was really um, deployed strategically. You can't really believe that it's, it's, it's still, it's very much still a part of the ideology, but more importantly, it's part of the repertoire of social management uh, that was very effective in managing the uh, sentiment or emotions online. Just like, just like the, uh, the celebrating of the Spirit Festival, we, I think the government do have a very good policy, right? To, to, to tell people you need to stay at your city, your working city, and to celebrate the Spirit Festival with your friends and not, and rather, the, rather than your family relatives. I think the social government is, do, the, do a good job to convince the people to accept this policy. I don't know why I accept it so naturally. <laughs> I think, yeah, we, we should do this. It's, it's good, it's possible. That is, I think, no problem. Uh, yeah. So I totally agree with that. So it's no, it's, I think control is not a proper word, actually. Yeah. You, if we adopt the official term, it's not it's no longer control. It's actually about opinion leadership. Yeah, yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for your thoughts on this and to our audience for their great questions. I'll pass it back to the Beijing Center now to wrap up. Yeah, I, I know like we're running out of time right now, but then suddenly uh, there is a very interesting, I can see heavy question popping up here. So maybe one last question. So some of some of the audience uh, ask, uh, I'd like to hear panelists thoughts about crime against Asians, anti-Asia attack recently around the world due to the pandemic. So what are their perspectives and how that related to, you know, the sacrifice culture in East Asia? Because I feel like it's, it's really, uh, it's increasing right now, the, the tech issues in the United States and the rest of the world. Do you have any comments or thoughts on this? It's really heartbreaking. <laughs> when people have this high uncertainty, you know, we, we become anxious and we're trying to find an outlet. And in this case, it's very unfortunate that people use racism as an outlet and I, I I was in Korea when it was uh, unfolding, and but most of my friends back in the states, I mean, like even in New York, I, come on, it's New York City. Everyone is from somewhere else. Like no one really judges other people by skin color, at least that's the New York I remember. But like people actually experiencing this uh, derogatory comments from the grocery stores. I mean, it's really heartbreaking, and also, I think it's just. There are a lot of counteracts is going on. Now it's still getting better, right? Like a after a year, now we do not see a lot of those kind of information. But I think it's it's just uncertainty. The society get through this uncertainty together. People really needed an outlet, and they took it on this as a racism, and it's unacceptable, obviously. 
and there should be more uh, strict uh, policy to prevent that or that punish it more harshly later on and so on and so forth. But I think it's really, uh, yeah, it, it, I, I, I really couldn't believe what's going on in the state. What I'm hearing from my friends, the, their first experience, hands experience, it was like, that was not like that when I was there. But I think it's really about this uncertainty, high uncertainty, especially when New York hits lots of like patients, when the number goes up really crazy and people get this collective anxiousness that brought them to do something really deviant behavior, right? So don't get offended by it, you know, just like they needed an outlet. It's like a momentum of the craziness, the collective effervescence that people get into this deviant behavior. But I, I hope that things are gonna get better. Yeah. Okay, it's my turn. Okay, actually, I honestly speaking, I didn't see any connections between these affairs to the sacrifice culture. I just feel like it's so ridiculous and it's so weird for me. Hey guys, we all are human beings. We, we all hate of this and we all blame for something and we all try to do something. And why we are blaming somebody for why we have this kind of skin colors problems, it's not the time, right? We, and we would never, it's not about time problem. We would never do this. But the most important thing is that you need, you need to believe whether you are in China or you are in America or you are in England, we all don't want to have this kind of issues. We all have the similar feelings. So why you blame me or why I blame you? It's, it's not about this sense. This is my, my, my response to this question. I, I didn't see any connections to the sacrifice culture, but I just want to think that we need to communicate. And we also need to know we have the similar feelings there. And it's not right to blame something, especially to let the skin colors issues come in. Uh, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, I basically um, agree with Professor Xing and Professor Lee on that note. And I think uh, it has very little to do with these uh, so-called unique Eastern or Chinese uh, cultural sacrifice. Um, um, and moreover, I think it's universal to any human community that when a uh, crisis of a certain nature, right, when something that were, when, when people are fell victim to some kind of um, unknown crisis, when there's no uh, clear solutions out of that, sometimes people get very emotional and instinctively they seek like so-called cultural outsiders as the victim, right? And that applies to any form of culture, even Chinese culture, even Korean, even Japanese, right? Uh, in time of crisis, in historical terms, we, we see a lot of these kind of things happening time and again, and it's very sad and disconcerting, but, it, but at the same time, I, I would, I would say that it has nothing to do with actually uh, the difference between the West and the East. It has more to do with this kind of universal uh, sense of insecurity, uh, uncertainty, and fear created by a certain set of situations. And I think it will eventually fade away. It's not really, while it has been a very serious issue nowadays, it, I, I believe it will not um, eventually go and pass. Can I, can I add a point? Yeah. Um, it reminds me about another thing because um, these things, it happens in Wuhan first, right? Whenever the Wuhan happens, uh, it, it happens there. And first we have, oh, what's going on in Wuhan? And we have, maybe some of us have blamed people in Wuhan for, oh, what do you have done there? Do you have some responsibility there? You need to... You need to do something, but you didn't do it. And you make all of us to take in this wall, right? We also have this kind of a trend, but I think the nation, the leader of the nation have made very good leadership here. It is not time to, it is not right to blame something. We need to work together to know how to deal with this, with this situation. And it is because of this trend, China have done a lot. I think it will do it very well. 
to defeat this kind of uh, epidemic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, such a fruitful and insightful discussion this, you know, um, not very friendly time slot and also test schedule. I know it's very late uh, for Professor Shannon and Professor Lee. Um, um, but I have to say is that um, the notion of, we use notion of sacrifice as the topic of this event is not uh, as a fixed uh, answer or statement. It's more like a trigger or prompt to try to elicit more interpretations of on this topic. So I'm really impressed by your uh, answers or interpretations such as uh, Professor Lee said, your, you more prefer using dedication instead of notions to sacrifice. And also Professor, um, I'm very impressed by Professor Shin's um, interpretation like um, the voluntary compliance. And I, I'm also asking myself, I'm really sacrificing myself in order to uh, to not only care about others' interests, but also my personal interest. And also um, very uh, fascinated, and um, it's very fascinated, fascinating to hear about uh, Dr. Yan Jie's uh, interpretation, like internal cohesion with family and also coordinated efforts when you're talking about the COVID-19 responses in East Asia. So it's very fruitful discussion. I wish we could have more time on this. And also, yeah, and I, I want to close this webinar by just the last question is that I think um, those malicious crime uh, is coming from those minority. I believe, I still believe that a majority of people, we are kind, open-minded and understandable, um, empathetic, I think at least. So, and also I think those crime may be influenced by the fake information, uh, misinformation and fake news as well, because those news and or, yeah, news or information, kind of reinforce the bad images of East Asian people, you know, the other uh, disadvantaged communities. So I think, yeah, uh, there is no one solution to, to tackle this issue, but I think what we can do is just as Professor Lee said, keep communicating and keep, you know, be critical thinking. So I think um, sooner or later, everything will be better. So thank you all for making the time. And we hope uh, we already look forward to the next, another collaboration in the future. Thank you all. Thank you, Xiang Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. thank you for making the time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good night and have a good, good day. Night.